that was incredible. Well done. I think I can speak for everybody here. I'm, I'm really impressed, not just by Lynette, but by everybody involved in the school strike movement. It's been one of the most, in 30 years of working on climate change, it's been one of the most, probably the most inspiring things that's, that's happened to me. Um, you know, we've been working on talking about this issue for, uh, as I say, I, I started working on this in 1990, I guess. Um, uh, the, the change that, that you guys have done in, in a year is probably more than we've done in the previous 29, so, so well done to all of you. Um, I'm just here to give you the, the very big picture um, and three things to remember in case you get um, either depressed or bored um, in the course of, you should, certainly shouldn't get bored, um, in the course of the next uh, few, uh, couple of days and the second session. Um, three things about climate change or human influence on climate. Uh, it's real, uh, it is serious, I hope I don't need to convince you of that, and it's fixable. Um, where are we at now? Um, it's already happening. Um, we've reached one degree. Um, at the rate we're warming at the moment, you don't need a climate scientist to tell you we'll get to, two, to one and a half degrees around 2040. There's obviously some uncertainty in that. We could get to one and a half degrees even earlier than that. But you can see where we're going, and that sets the time scale at which we have to do something about it if we want to limit warming to below 1.5 degrees. Because, again, you don't need, you don't need me to answer this question. If you're um, driving down a road at a certain speed, I'm sure you've just done the GCSE, so you'll know exactly how to do this. You're driving down a road at a certain speed, you want to stop at the stop sign, you start braking, uh, you know exactly how fast you have to brake in order to stop at the stop sign. Okay? We're driving towards 1.5 <coughs> degrees at a speed of 0.2 degrees per decade. You don't need a climate model. Sorry, do you want me to hold that up? Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Um, you don't need a climate model to tell you how hard you need to break. So we need to, that's how we know that we need to get global emissions down to net zero. We need to stop the warming by mid-century if we're to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So as I, keep, as I keep coming back to, this is what we learn from the data, from what's already happened. It's, it's not a complicated prediction based on obscure models. It's just breaking distances. So, <coughs> the second point, that it's serious. Um, you hear a lot about the impacts of climate change. There's many documentaries and so on, I'm sure you've seen about these things. I just wanted to focus on one, because a lot of quite confusing things are said about it. And this, may not seem the, the most sort of inspiring impact, but it's one that we do have to think about very hard, which is the economic impact of climate change on the world. Um, this map, uh, one of the lines of evidence in the IPCC 1.5 degrees report, shows the countries in, in the map, the countries in purple there, are the ones that are significantly impacted in terms of a reduction in their economic growth by a warming of 1.5 degrees. So even at 1.5 degrees, we do see negative impacts on economic growth. And notice where they are. Picking up on what Lynette just said, these are not the countries that have contributed most to this problem. And if we allow it to continue to two degrees, the number of countries adversely affected grows. Interestingly, you're seeing some green countries here. Those are countries that this is research done here at the University of, of Oxford. Um, and based on this research, there may be small benefits to some countries as well, which is intriguing. The UK, by the way, is sort of somewhere in the middle, mo modest losses compared to many other parts of the world. But the crucial point I want to emphasize to you is not that we know exactly what's going to happen in different parts of the world, but one thing we're very sure about, it will be very different in different parts of the world. And people ask me, you know, Am I kept awake by the prospect of five degrees of warming? To be honest with you, that's not what keeps me awake at night as a climate scientist. It's the prospect of when these countries that are colored purple on this map behind me in mid-century realize what's being done to them by other countries of the world, what's going to happen then? 
they'll be subject to the consequences of a process over which they have no control and which is not their fault, and that could be the trigger of things that would really frighten me in terms of the future. Not just migration, but potential conflict as well. But the third point, on a cheerful point, it is fixable. One of the key questions we were asked in the IPCC 1.5 degrees report is, is it possible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees? And the answer is it is. There's a lot of different pathways out there, different ways in which we could change emissions in order to limit warming to that, that goal, they all involve reducing emissions. They involve reducing emissions either very soon, down to zero by mid-century, and then holding emissions at zero from then on. If we don't reduce emissions immediately, you'll notice well, there's a whole spaghetti of pathways behind this, but I'm sort of distilling out what they all have in common. If we don't reduce emissions soon, if we dither for another decade or so and then start to reduce emissions, here's a sort of very simple fact about the climate system for you to remember. The temperature we end up at depends on the area under these curves. So if we dither for another 10 years, we dump another 400 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, and the only way to get back to 1.5 degrees then is to pump that 400 billion tons back out again. That's this intergenerational transaction that Lynette is talking about when she says that there's this, this, this burden being placed on the next generation to clean up after the present one. It's worth, by the way, about six trillion pounds per year. That would be the cost of scrubbing back out the carbon dioxide we're currently dumping into the atmosphere. And in, you know, that's the cost of cleaning up the landfill. We're using the atmosphere as a landfill we're dumping CO2 into it. To get that back out again, to clean it up, would be costing, at the rate we're dumping it in, six trillion pounds per year. I think we can be fairly confident the next generation is not gonna thank us for the bill. It's fixable, and this is a, 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 another figure from that report, which shows the investment we need to make in the energy system over the, up till 2050, in two very different futures. On the left, there's what they call the baseline, which is basically the, the fossil-fueled future, where we don't really bother with climate change at all. And on the right is a future in which we meet the goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. At the time our report came out, lots of headlines came out saying 1.5 degrees will cost an extraordinary amount of money. Even more recently, um, our own uh, former uh, Secretary of State for, 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 for the Treasury um, say, um, was, was muttering about it will cost a trillion pounds of, you know, for, for, for Britain to achieve. These numbers are very large. Okay? That's the investment required in our energy system to decarbonize it by mid-century to meet the 1.5 degree goal. 2.5% you know, 2, 2 or so of global domestic products is a lot of money. But we're going to be investing in our energy system anyway, just to keep the lights on. The difference, the choice we have to make, is between investing 2% of our GDP into the energy system in fossil fuel plants, and the kind of things that we might well have to throw away mid-century, or the next generation will have to throw away because they won't be able to use them anymore because they cause climate change, and investing 40% more in an energy system that's fit for the 22nd century. That's the fundamental choice we face. It's about what we invest in. It's not about just spending money. It's about time scales over which you want these investments to pay off. The additional cost of a 1.5 degree future over what we would have to spend on the energy system anyway, just to keep the lights on, is about 10% of what we currently spend on energy. That's not to belittle it, it's a lot of money because we spend a very, very large amount of money on energy. 10% of the world economy is spent on energy. But just 10% of that would solve this problem. And one of the questions I want you to ask yourselves is, we're being asked to do lots of things as a community and as citizens to address climate change. How can we make sure that the global energy industry plays its part as well? Well,